Michigan Out of Doors Online is brought to you in part by by Big Fish Charter Services in Algonac. Experience a world-class musky fishery on Lake St. Clair for predator fishing or a once-in-a-lifetime trip on the St. Clair River to tangle with a prehistoric lake sturgeon at Big Fish Charter Services. It's all about big fish. Welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. I'm Jenny Olson and we've got another all new show for you this week. I'll take you down to the southern part of our state to Branch County where I spent one day trying to cram in as many hunting activities as I possibly could with a great group of guys that lives down there. You won't want to miss that and it's hard to believe with the springtime weather we're having this week in Michigan but firearm deer season is just over a week away. We're going to bring you a couple of tips on how to sight in that deer gun to get ready for the season as well as a couple other fun things. Well that's right Jenny we do have a few more things on this week's show and if folks do a good job at setting in their firearm for the upcoming deer season they're going to have some venison at the end of the day and we have got a really good venison recipe for you on this week's show venison wellington you won't want to miss that story. We're also going to stop in with a sportsman who uh, fell from a tree stand just in the last year or so and he's got some good safety tips for us kind of some things to think about as we get out there into the woods and get heading up some trees or some tree stands that maybe we haven't been in in quite a while. Lots of good stuff on this week's show so you stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger and it's time for Michigan out of doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze, dancing on the pine forest floor. The autumn colors catch your eyes, here come the crystal winter skies. It's Michigan, Michigan out of doors. Someday our children all will see this is their finest legacy, the wonder and the love of Michigan as the wind comes whispering through the trees the sweet smell of nature's in the air from the great lakes to the quiet stream shining like a sportsman's dream it's the love of michigan we all share michigan out of doors is presented by by greenstone farm credit services making recreational land ownership possible across michigan and northeast wisconsin Begin your land financing journey at one of Greenstone's 37 locations or visit greenstonefcs.com. By the Ultimate Sports Show Tour, producing consumer shows including the Ultimate Fishing Show Detroit, January 7th through 10th at Novi Suburban Collection Showplace. The show features fishing tackle, fishing trips, fishing boats, and seminars on every Michigan game fish. The Ultimate Fishing Show Detroit, January 7th through 10th. By Country Smokehouse, offering a variety of meat products, Country Smokehouse is located three miles south of I-69 on M53, just south of Imlay City. Country Smokehouse is a meat processor, a butcher, and a destination for sportsmen. We all have one, that perfect spot, a special place we go to smooth out the ripples of the day. Our perfect spot is calling. Our perfect spot is pure Michigan. Your trip begins at Michigan.org. in the year, I received an email from Kevin Wishmeyer, a longtime viewer of the show. Kevin invited me down to his neck of the woods in Branch County to check out the Coldwater and Bronson area and all of the outdoor activities it has to offer. I met up with Kevin at Bill's Steakhouse, a place he co-owns and operates here in Bronson. It's also home to the buck that appears at the beginning of our show every week. Yeah, I, my family and I have been watching Michigan Out of Doors for years, so it was kind of neat now that, you know, my dad watched it, and now I've watched it, and I, and I started making my kids watch it, and now they want to watch it all the time. Now they're like, oh, Dad, let's watch the DVR episode, because we don't always catch it right when it's on, so we always make sure we DVR it, and then we watch it as a family, so it's kind of exciting for us to um, get to have you guys come down and be a part of something that we feel like we've been a part of, you know, through the TV. The first adventure that Kevin had set up for me and the camera was a duck hunt just outside of Coldwater with his good friend, Russ Feller. So what's the plan this morning? Well, we're just going to a small slough uh, north of here a couple miles. Uh, it's about four acres maybe, but it's, it's, uh, it's been good to us in the past, so we'll see. We should be seeing uh, mallards and woodies this morning. All right, who do we have with us, hunting and dog-wise and people-wise? Well, I've got Ruby, my five-year-old British lab, Chad Parker here. Uh, Mike Boyd will be meeting us out there, so we'll have a good crew. Well, just Russ is such a unique guy. You know, he, he is, uh, 
he is such a straight-laced guy, but then when you get him out, he can, he can relax, and he really is so passionate about duck hunting, and he's, he's just one of those interesting characters who, he was so nervous about coming on the show because he was worried about his spots and everything else, and he was, and he's just wanted everything to be perfect. And I think when, when you get to be around somebody who has so many years in a particular sport, and you get to see them set up their decoys, and you get to hear them, you know, call call the animal in. You get to see, you know, a dog like Ruby work, who's been trained so well, and to hear, sit in a blind and hear the stories that those kind of people share together. He and Mike have been together for decades, and then for someone like Chad to be a part of that, I think is, I think it's just something special that you get to see in the outdoors that you don't see everywhere else. This it's a mentor program. Um, and that's something special. These guys who have been together for decades now sharing a sport with somebody new. You know, something like that that Russ gets to pass on to somebody like Chad, who's never done it before. I think that's kind of special. Um, it's, I've got a lot of history here. We've shot an awful lot of ducks. Uh, I'm a little surprised we're not seeing more today because it hasn't had much pressure, but uh, that's hunting, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, my best hunts over the years have been uh, maybe mid-season here when hasn't been hassled for a while and I'll come scout it and find 50 to 150 ducks and uh. set up the next morning and you know it's it can be very good but that's you know, duck hunting anywhere you know the patterns of weather and hunting around you know the, the pressure in the area in general can affect a spot and the migration patterns but you, know, you take the good with the bad yeah having fun though right yeah Sure. <laughs> Better than sitting home. Well, we wrapped up the duck hunt and I headed to Chad's house for our next hunt of the day. Well, Chad, we got a little midday activity going on, huh? Yeah, um, the morning duck hunt wasn't greatly productive, so we're going to go out and see if we can get some squirrel. Um, been doing quite a bit of uh, bow hunting and that just isn't panning out right now, but the squirrel are everywhere. So we're gonna go out and see if we can get rid of some of them. Okay, how much land do you have here? Uh, there's 33 acres. Okay. Uh, there's probably 22, 23 of woods, and then in about eight or nine of field, so. Chad's property looked pretty promising for a good squirrel hunt. We had a couple of hours to spend here, and Chad and Kevin love hunting just about anything they can. We met through, uh, our, actually our wives pushed us together because they had a Bible study going and they wanted all of us guys to start doing a group together. And so our wives kind of pushed us together. Uh, at the time I really you know, didn't have a lot of friends that were my age in the area, uh, still after a few years of living here. So they forced us together and just through talking and hanging out a little bit, we realized, okay, we both fish, we both like to hunt, and we both just love being outdoors in general. So. And being that we have such similar interests just out even side of hunting, we, uh, we, we hit it off and became pretty good friends. And um, it was through that that we started hunting together and fishing together. And I, I can't think of a trip that I've been on or he's been on outside of family trips that we haven't been together on a hunting or fishing trip. It just seems like we're always together unless it's a family outing. Nice Beautiful, gun. and look at this. Nice shot. Yep, we got him right there. Oh, cool. Perfect. Good deal. Cool. All right. Thanks, pal. Load them up. See if we can't get a few more before it's time to head out yeah. to the field for deer. The squirrel hunt ended up being a little like our duck hunt. The guys dropped two squirrels for the game bag and needed to head out and get ready for some deer and turkey hunting. The leaves on the trees had made it a little more challenging than a winter squirrel hunt, but it was still a lot of fun. Kevin's 10-year-old son, Lucas, was done with school for the day, and he had a couple of tags he was looking to fill. The guys headed out to a piece of property that Kevin leases and dropped off Chad to hunt in one of their ground blinds, and then they got settled into theirs. Chad was armed with his compound bow and a GoPro camera and was looking for a turkey. Kevin says this property holds lots of deer and a few different flocks of turkeys, so hopes were high as we settled in. Lucas was looking for a buck, a doe, or a turkey to walk past him and his trusty crossbow. He was pretty excited to be out here, and so was his dad. It's been special. Uh, I started hunting later uh, in life, um, probably my mid-20s. So to be able to share something that I'm so passionate about, such an early time in my hunting life, I'd say, um, to pass it on to your son, who, with three different businesses, with the stresses of life and wife and two other children as well, it's hard to spend time individually with your kids. And to do something where you can go for four hours and just sit in quiet with your son and we tell jokes and we read books and 
He might play a video game or two on the phone, but those are times that we get to spend one-on-one, -on -one, and I get to share some of the most beautiful parts of God's creation here in Michigan with him. We have you know, the fields that we're sitting in, the woods that we're sitting in, the animals, the birds that are chirping. It's all those different things that I get to share with him that I'm passionate about that you wouldn't get to if you were sitting at home, even outside playing catch. You, you know, that's time you get to spend together, but you don't get to share in some of the unique things that happen in the outdoors. Kevin and Lucas were keeping entertained out here with a steady parade of does and fawns passing by just too far away for Lucas and his crossbow to get off a shot. Kevin says the cold water area is a pretty special place. It's just an interesting part of the state. Outside of elk and bear, we really have everything in such a concentrated area. You don't have to drive an hour, two hours to reach anything. Anything that you want to fish for is right here, um, which is kind of exciting. You want to hunt for something, it's right here. And it's just a, a unique set of circumstances with some of the people that you have. You've got um, little groups and organizations popping up that help youth, that help disabled people and veterans, all right here. And it's just, you see like what you got to see with Russ Feller, someone in his 70s who wants to hunt with people in their 30s, and then who wants to pass that along to people in their teens. So you have this whole like lineage of uh, being a Michigan outdoorsman happening, which is kind of a neat, neat scenario to watch. There's plenty out here to watch, that's for sure. Chad was capturing some GoPro footage of does and turkeys out in front of his blind, and if you watch closely, you'll see him arrow a big long beard, a challenging feat to pull off. He is. He had a, he, he's an excellent outdoorsman. Chad is a responsible, ethical, and excellent hunter. He is a, an outdoorsman. He loves to, he, he practices everything that he does. So to be able to, in one day, go out and shoot a duck, or two actually, Michigan ducks, and then to go out and be able to go out and harvest some squirrels, Chad. and then to be able to go out and do a turkey, and to then do it with three different weapons. You know, he did it with a shotgun, he did it with a rifle, with a 22 rifle, and then to be able to go out with his bow and harvest a beautiful Michigan tom. Just to be able to do all that was something special, and it's someone like Chad who puts in that time and effort, and who is such an excellent outdoorsman, and then he becomes a show superstar. <laughs> From what I can tell, Chad is a pretty humble guy and didn't set out to be the superstar of the show, but he sure did some impressive shooting out here today. Kevin, Chad, Russ, Mike, and Lucas are all great outdoorsmen who have a passion for being out in the woods and on the water, pursuing the great days of field that memories are made of. Cold water is a place worth spending some time. The sense of community is woven into the fabric of the lifestyle here. It's a place where traditions are passed from one generation to the next and new friendships are formed along the way. And that's really what it's all about here in Michigan's Out of Doors. All right, well, we are here today at the Capital City Rifle Club, uh, just north of Williamston, uh, kind of Lansing area. We're here with Mike Morris. Mike is a uh, former military, uh, ex-Marine, actually, and uh, is friends of ours from Vanguard, who's kind of our shooting expert. Um, and we're going to be uh, sighting in a gun today, a 44 mag that I'm getting set up for my kids. We're a couple weeks before the deer season. Mike, as an expert shooter, uh, you know, we just kind of want to get some tips today. What are some common mistakes you see guys make, whether that's at the range doing what we're doing today or even out hunting? What are just some good you know, things that you see, you know, mistakes guys make? Yes, Jimmy, first of all, when you're sighting in a rifle, you got to make sure you're precise and have it on the paper. Uh, to bore sight is the number one crucial step to being performing anytime you're going out shooting. Okay. Uh, some of the things people make commonly mistakes is they take it out on the range from the year before, they think it's going to be solid, get ready to put it on paper and find out, you know, from bumping it around or just not shooting it a while, it's no longer on paper. Okay. So bore sighting is the number one thing you want to make sure you do. And so for people that don't even know what bore sighting is, that's physically looking right down the barrel, correct? Uh, bore sighting is when you, you got a first round shot down, down range, you want to make sure it's sighted in. Um, if you're using a laser bore sighter, in other words, you're going to have a dot through the, the end of the uh, barrel. Okay. It's going to put it down range to where you're trying to aim. And then you're going to take your scope crosshairs or your iron sights and match it. Okay. So that's about where I'm at with this gun here. So we're gonna, we'll shoot it in a minute. But what are some, some tips, that, you know, if you're giving a guy, whether he's at the range or he's going to be out uh, deer hunting this year, what are some good tips to, to be a more accurate shooter? Well, first of all, um, after you get it sighted in on paper and you go out shooting, uh, when you're using a live scenario, you, a couple of elements I noticed that helps when shooting 
is anytime you get into a situation where you're using your rifle for hunting, uh, you're going to you're gonna get a little excited. Yeah. So first of all, I would say control breathing. Hmm. Make sure you breathe control and you squeeze the trigger instead of jerk. That's most common mistakes when firing. Okay. And then uh, I think guys are doing a better job of this now because you see so many shooting sticks and different things. How important is a good rest when you're out there? Very important. Uh, without a steady hand, your shot's going to be all over the place. So to get target accuracy and acquisition, you got to have a steady hand, okay. be it either through a shooting rest, shooting stick, or a good support. Okay. And how important is it to know the effective range of your weapon? I know this, you know, this 44 mag here, that's 100 yard, stretching at 150. If you're shooting a 30 out six or a seven millimeter mag, whatever you got, how, how important is it to know and, and, and to should you be practicing at these long ranges or are you good at 100? You're, you're essentially here in Michigan, especially the southern part of Michigan, you're gonna be shooting anywhere from around 100 yards or up to 200 yards right in there. Uh, it's very important to know the maximum accuracy okay. level, but depending on the application using it, you're gonna be safely assumed you're gonna practice at 100 yards sighted in, you're gonna be relatively on. All right, so this is what we're gonna to try to do. I've heard people talk about this, I've never done it myself. This is called the one-shot sight in. So what we've got right now is we've got this 44 mag that's bore sighted. So I've lined up, taken the bolt out, looked down through the bore, and I've got it to where it looks like the bullseye is in the middle of the, of the bore. And now I've walked the scope over to about that same spot. So I'm hoping that we're on the paper. And what other gun guys that are way better at this than me have explained to me is you take one shot, and then you get that, so I'm gonna aim right at the bullseye, take one shot, and then wherever that prints, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have the gun, we're gonna have it nice and stable in this, in this vise, and I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna aim at the bullseye, and then I'm gonna walk the scope over to where the bullet actually impacted the paper. So, our first shot, that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna walk it over, and then in theory, once we do that, because you're gonna follow your miss, just like you would with a bow, you're gonna follow our, follow our miss, we're gonna walk our crosshairs up to where it impacted the paper, and then we're going to aim at the bull again, take a second shot, and that should be, fingers crossed, it should be right there near the bullseye. Now, this is a 44 mag, so this is not a tack driver. This is not a 243 or a 270, so it's not going to probably have a half-inch group. I'm hoping to have maybe an inch to two-inch groups with this gun. That would be really pretty good, I think. So we're going to send some, uh, send some rounds down range and see how it works. Okay, so I think this kind of worked. <laughs> Let me explain what we did. This target here was just after bore sighting the gun. So just kind of looking down the bore, walking the crosshairs over to kind of guesstimating where we're at. We're on the paper, we're low and right. I took two shots because again, even though we're calling this a one shot sight in, the gun that I'm using, this 44 mag, is not a tack driver at 100 yards. I'm hoping for like a two inch group. I think would be pretty realistic out of this gun. So I shot two times to see where we're at. So then what I did is I aimed back here and I walked the crosshairs down here to cut the difference to about right here. So then I moved over to this target and I took a three shot group. So even though we're calling it again a one shot sight in, the, the one shot part of it is you take one shot and you walk over to where it is, shoot it again. And that's what I did here and I got a, about a two inch group here um, from here to here. And so this one could have been me a little bit uh, wiggling but a two-shot group out of that gun. Now, if I was shooting my 243, I would definitely not be happy with a two-inch group at 100 yards. With this 44 mag, uh, not a heavy-barreled gun, it's a very light gun. Um, I think two inches is about what you can expect at 100 yards. Whether you are setting in a brand new gun for this season, or you've been hunting with the same gun for decades, make sure you get to the range, make sure that you're sighted in properly, and to everybody hitting the woods on November the 15th, good luck and be safe. This week we head back to the Canadian Lakes area and stop in with good friend Jim Wood from the Antlers Fireside Grill to learn how to cook venison at Wellington, a dish that will become one of my new favorites. So this is a perfect dish to kind of take if you're doing a wild game party. Okay. Because uh, you can prepare, you know, pretty much the entire thing aside from the final cooking process at your house. Okay. And then it's, 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 it's going over to the party about half cooked. Okay. And you can just throw it into the oven and you can impress Bob or Bill or whatever his name might be. And yeah. it's probably going to be a lot better than what he made. <laughs> so we start by, we're getting our pan hot over here. Okay. A little bit of oil and we're going to sear this. It's going to go about 10 seconds on each side. So nice and quick. You don't want to mess with it. You're look, basically, you're just looking to get a good sear on it. 
that a Wellington usually had some sort of pastry involved, so I was really curious how this all was going to work. So now we're, we're building the basis for the Wellington. So this puff pastry isn't big enough for the enormous backstrap <laughs> And could you had. use any kind of store-bought? Yep. Okay. Which is exactly what this is. Okay. It's not some fancy chef thing. Well, you know, making this is kind of a painstaking process, and to be perfectly honest with you, it's really not worth it. So. Gotcha. Okay, so a little bit so of ham. So this is actually, a Mich this is Michigan ham. Uh, it's a company based out of uh, Southeast Michigan. And we're gonna take, this is a combination of cream cheese uh, and butter. Cream and what, cheese and butter. What we're right. making is kind of uh, what you might see at the supermarket, uh, Borzin cheese. Okay. So we've got the cream cheese and butter here. Now what this is, these are uh, finely minced and dried morels that we oh. soaked in water overnight. Okay. So it's kind of a way to use up, you know. Some of the last morels of the year. Yep. Now, I know most of you don't have any morels just laying around, but with or without them, this dish is one you need to try. So you want to coat this venison in a little bit of Dijon mustard. Hmm. I'm just going to take, rub that in a little bit. Okay. All right. Then apply the mixture there. Yep, you want to liberally apply this. So you're just going to take and roll it over. So it's almost like a <clears throat> high high tech pasty. <laughs> so that's that's one way of, of, of explaining it, yeah. And I am a pasty guy, so I'm not going to be offended by there that. There you go. See, I just came up with a new you thing did. for you. I like that. It's well, whatever you call this dish, it's pretty simple and very good. Bake time depends a little bit on the size of your meat, and once done, it's time to plate. I always like to kind of snip the ends off. And then go right through the middle. Venison loin can be cooked a lot of ways and be good almost every time. But putting it in butter and cream cheese and wrapping it with some pastry is out of this world. For the full recipe, check out our website. Well, I gotta be honest with you, that is one of the best venison recipes I've ever tried. And if you're looking for a new way to prepare some backstrap this year, give it a shot. What we're gonna do now is visit with a friend of the show, Kim Knorr. Now, Kim fell from a tree stand just this past season and really has some good words of advice for all of us, whether you're a bow hunter or a gun hunter, some good advice for all of us to think through when it comes to tree stand safety. Well, it was December last year, muzzleloader season. I uh, went out hunting. I was sitting in a heated shack. I uh, wasn't successful that night, so I closed up the shack and was getting down. And uh, when I was getting out of the heated stand, I took a step down on the ladder. And the second step, the rung on the ladder broke, and I fell about 11 feet and landed on my head. After you know six, seven months, I mean, I'm back to pretty much a full recovery back to hunting, golfing, fishing, doing everything I enjoy outdoors. This was one blind I never expected something to happen, you know, I mean it was a two by six ladder which which moving forward I'm probably gonna go with a more manufactured steel ladder. Um, on those it's kind of tough to get like a hunting safety harness, you know, in a heated blind, but on my tree stands I every time I'm in I, I harness in. I bought some of them lifelines that hook on the base of the tree and up into the top so I'm I'm hooked in every time I'm in the stand now. And you know, on a heated shack, one thing I'm gonna start doing is putting handrails on the ladders and just make sure that you know you have both hands on the ladder and, and one foot at all times and just be a lot more careful. You know, something I never thought would happen to me and, and an accident happened within a second. Just like everybody else, I never thought an accident would ever happen to me. You know, I was thought I was being safe and and just Within a split second it happens, so it can happen to anybody. So everybody just be careful out there, you know, make sure you wear your safety harness, be, be very careful getting in and out of your stand and your blinds and just have a happy, safe hunting season and I wish you all the best of luck. 
Well, special thanks to Kim for helping us shed a little light on tree stand safety. Whether you're a bow hunter and you've been going up and down your stand all year, or whether you're just a gun hunter and you get out for just a few days around the 15th, make sure that you are being as safe as possible. Double check and triple check those ladders. Make sure that you're using a fall restraint harness whenever possible. Good luck to everybody out there. And hey, make sure you join us on next week's show. We've got a tremendous bow hunt for you. Then after that, of course, we've got the firearm deer season openers. There is just so much going on right now if you are a sportsman here in the state of Michigan. Get out there, enjoy it. And hey, if we don't see it in the woods or on the water, hopefully we'll see you right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by by the Michigan Chapters of Safari Club International. For over 40 years, SCI has been protecting hunters' rights and promoting wildlife conservation here in Michigan and around the world. SCI chapter locations can be found on the web at firstformichigan.org. By Jay's Sporting Goods with locations in Clare and Gaylord. Jay's serving the Michigan outdoor enthusiast since 1971 with a wide variety of outdoor products. The gear, the knowledge, the tradition of Jays. On the web at jayssportinggoods.com. By Rosie Brothers. Located in Dryden, Michigan, Rosie Brothers has been serving Michigan for over 40 years. Specializing in outdoor needs, Rosie Brothers features Kubota tractors and equipment for use in farm, home, or commercial needs. On the web at rosiebrosinc.com. By Propane. Clean American Energy. Propane retailers promote the safe use of Michigan-produced gas energy in homes, farms, and businesses across our great state. Learn more at usemichiganpropane.com. Closed captioning is provided by the Michigan Propane Gas Association. Clean American Energy. Propane realtors promote the safe use of Michigan-produced gas to outdoor enthusiasts across our great state. I am a Michigan man Changing seasons paint the scene Like rainbow trout in a hidden stream The white-tailed deer in the tall pine trees I am a Michigan man I am, I am a Michigan man Ask where I'm from and I'll show you my hands Lord above